Hi, everyone. Um, didn't realize it's just over noon. And so um, just want to get everybody in off of the waiting room. I'm Debbie Schwartz, founder of Rhodes College and the Paying for College 101 Facebook group. I am just Hi. going to spotlight myself and Monica Ware, War, I'm not sure. Monica Ware. <laughs> Ware, sorry. Um, uh, so, because Monica is um, uh, going to be doing the presentation with me. Okay. So, thank you guys for joining us um, on a Friday at noon. Well, it's noon Eastern time, so don't know um, where you might be Zooming from. If you can put in the chat um, where you're from what year in high school your student is and kind of where you are in the college search process. Have you done any research? Um, have you visited any schools? It's just helpful for us to know who's here. Um, so we get a sense, you know, are we, um, or is it mostly families of rising uh, seniors? We're kind of at that point of the year where where we have to switch the language to rising <laughs> or we um, are there mostly, or are there families here with, um, you know, I guess rising uh, juniors. Okay. Oh, good. All over the place, rising seniors, rising juniors from Georgia, Delaware. San I even saw an eighth grade, eighth grade student. Very, I mean, which is fantastic. Exactly. The earlier you can come to these and start learning the better, but it's hard to get people you know, into that groove. Okay, thank you everyone for sharing. Um, so let me just give you a quick little housekeeping. This is technically a meeting and I only say that as opposed to a webinar. I only say that because um, you can unmute yourself if you really wanna talk and that happens sometimes or, you know, instead of putting your question in the chat. But if you're um, not, don't have anything to say, you can keep yourself unmuted. Uh, oh, sorry, if you, sorry, can you keep yourself muted? That would be better because sometimes it, it, um, we can hear the background noises. Um, please put your questions in chat. Monica and I were talking about this before we started. We tend to have so much information that sometimes we go a little longer, longer than we, you know, than we want for everybody's um, time, you know, um, uh, constraints. So we're gonna try and be as concise as possible. Um, I always look at the questions while we're doing the presentation. I may not ask, I may not pull as many questions in until the end because we want to make sure that we can get through um, our material. But please ask your questions in the chat and um, I will definitely be looking at them and we'll definitely try and answer as many as possible. And the last thing is that um, this is recorded and the link will go out tomorrow. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of people tend to watch these um, several times just to kind of get all the information in. So just wanted to let you know that you'll have access to this later. Good, thank you. Everybody who um, is coming in, please share um, as you join um, in the chat what state you're from. We see a lot of um, juniors in high school, what year in high school your student is, and if you've done any sort of research to date so far. Okay, I'm going to get started sharing my screen. Oops, sorry, wrong. Okay, let me share the slides. Um, Monica, can you see that? Yes. Great. You're all good. And let's get going. So today we are talking about merit scholarships. We're talking about how to build a balanced college list. And we're going to show you a tool that um, we offer called Rhodes College Insights. So um, just a quick overview of the agenda again. We're going to talk, tell you a little bit more about what merit scholarships are, just in case, you know, some people don't really understand what they are. Um, we're going to talk about the different numbers that are important for you to know in this process. Um, and, you know, they are SAI, COA, and college budget. I'm not even going to define them yet because we will as we get to the slides. We'll talk about um, some tips that we offer families about how you go about building that balanced college list. We'll show you how we use insights and then we're gonna answer more questions. Okay, Monica, passing it to you. All right, so one of the number one questions, I'm a college counselor and one of the number one questions I always 
get asked is, how do we pay for college? And that may seem like a silly question because, um, but it's not because many students um, are under the assumption that, you know, college is a certain amount or isn't a certain amount. So this is a really important information um, for us to fully cover what it looks like to pay for college. So I'm going to start with the best column I have found, which is free money. <laughs> These are um, a way to pay for college is through um, merit scholarships that are automatically applied when a student applies to a university. Um, that's one way. So when a student is applies, um, oftentimes, and that's why the insights tool that we'll show is so incredible, it shows what scholarships are available to students just for applying to that university so or college? What brings them to the university? They say, hey, I think we think you're a great fit. Here's some merit money that we will give you. There are also scholarships um, for merit, which means there's no financial need for merit-based scholarships. That's what the free money comes from. It's based on student test scores, GPA, essays, sometimes a resume, list of activities. Um, there are many factors, um, but merit scholarships are often awarded just for your student applying, depending on where they apply to college. Not every college will give automatic scholarships, but many will. Um, so merit just means on their own merit. It's, it's pretty easily defined on their merit. Private scholarships um, can range from needing that financial aid. Financial aid means it's based on the financial need, which we'll talk about where that number comes from. Some scholarships will have that caveat of, you know, we want some financial information. Is there some financial need? So those are the two big categories in the free money space of financial aid, which is financial need. Merit scholarships are based on a variety of factors, um, but based on merit, not necessarily financial need. Um, government grants and private scholarships are in that free money category. That means you don't have to pay them back. So when your students, everything in the free money category, it really does mean free money. The student is not um, asked to pay anything back. Um, that's really the favorite category. Um, maybe <laughs> the second favorite category is savings and income. So the family contribution, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like, what colleges see as um, basically they predict how much they think you'll be able to contribute to your students' um, college um, expenses. Something I think is really important. So we have some junior parents in here. We have a wide range of parents in here. Um, many times I have found in working with families, parents aren't very blunt with their students about how much they will be paying or um, giving their student um, information um, about their college expenses. So sometimes those hard conversations don't happen until their senior year or they apply to college. Um, we're actually seeing, we have a Facebook group and I've seen some posts where parents are saying, my student got into their dream school and our family is not able to pay for it. So that can be pretty devastating. So we're gonna be talking about college lists because that's an important piece before you decide what your dream school is. It's important to share with your family and share with your student, you know, what that contribution will look like. And then the category that's tough, um, that but is reality is the borrowed money. So those are government, um, loans that are taken out, private loans as well. Those are pieces um, that will have to be paid back. Um, they do attach to your student um, and they will have to pay those loans back within six months after they graduate from college. So those are the nuts and bolts of how to pay for college. So we can move on to why the college list is so important. So the college list is the list of schools that your student will apply for. Um, so in thinking about the college list, that's why we want to have these conversations early and often with students, because many times we hear of students who, again, say, I got into my dream school and now I can't pay for it. And that has happened to my students. And I always kick myself of, oh, I should have really explained what does a college list look like? So your college list is based on a variety of factors. Many, many families think, let's just go for it. And the best, whatever that looks like in your your mind, the best school my student can get into, let's go for that. And then we'll figure out the finances later. That's here at Road to College. That's not um, the best strategy. That's why we work with families all the time to explain um, what the final cost of college is. Um, so not only where your student will be accepted, but also how much will that cost. And that's a huge piece. And that's why our tool insights is so incredible for families to take a look and realize, 
oh, wow, this is how much if my student gets into their dream school. So what is a dream school? That's a whole other conversation. I won't go down that rabbit trail, but the college list is really not only where your student will get in. That, of course, is important to have a balanced list of where your student will get in, but also what money they might be offered through merit scholarships and what great schools are available for students to apply to to get those automatic scholarships to lessen the cost of college. We are seeing colleges charge upwards of almost six figures in some cases. So um, we really want to provide tools and resources available to your family to find the right school before the final cost is a limiting factor in your in your students' schools of higher education. Monica, One of my can I just, sorry, can I just say something? Somebody asked, um, you know, what group, what Facebook group are you referring to? And, and I just, yes. I put it in there. It's called Paying for College 101. But what I wanted to say about that is recently, about two weeks ago, we had somebody in the, in the Facebook group say, why is everybody talking about um, um, admissions and which colleges to apply to? I thought this group was about paying for college. And so everybody chimed in and said, boy, the biggest lesson you need to learn is your college list, your student's college list drives your family's cost of college. So that's why we talk so much about admissions. That's why we talk so much about you know, particular colleges and where to apply to, because that, that one um, step in the process, creating your student's college list is going to define so much. As Monica said, it's going to define your family's final costs of college. It's going to define, obviously, where your student can get in because if they're applying to the right schools. And on some level, it's also going to define how much work your student's going to have. And for those who have rising seniors, how much work they're going to have to do over the summer. Hopefully, they start over the summer in terms of writing um, essays. So um, just wanted, it was, it was just an interesting comment that somebody said, I thought this group was about paying for college. And then everybody chimed in and said, <laughs> it is. And the biggest way to make sure you're paying for college is to have the right college list. Absolutely. It's a great point. Thank you, Debbie. Um, one of our, our favorite phrases is students can't get money where they don't apply. So that's a key piece too. Um, applying to a school and seeing um, some schools, and we'll talk about that, are very transparent with the merit scholarships that they offer, but not all of them. So what is merit aid? So merit scholarship is a great way of thinking of it, again, as a tuition discount. So it's um, when you look at the cost of attendance of a school, it's school saying, hey, your student has really excelled and they've done a great job, either GPA, a combination of factors, holistic, and we want to offer them this money to make that college more attractive for that student. So it's a tuition discount um, based on your student's academic profile when they apply for that college. There are... Um, now, this is not dependent on financial need. Again, this is just merit based on merit. Um, most scholarships are renewable over four years. Um, there was a question I saw in the chat about um, when does this money get released? And that is a great question. Um, many times we see the largest chunk of money. So all schools have this like large chunk of money. Um, and we often see that early action is preferable for many schools because they have the most amount of academic awards to be able to give and scholarships that your student can apply for once they're admitted to that university. So it's very important um, for your student to develop their college list, really their junior summer, and start working on their applications. Many deadlines are November 1st. Um, merit scholarships, one thing to note, they don't increase as tuition increases. Um, but something that's important to note as well is that um, this is an overall um, tuition discount. So many times it has to do with tuition and not necessarily room and board. Um, so those are some things to take into account. Um, you can find the cost of attendance on college websites, uh, but Insights is really our best tool to find all the information you need to know about um, college admissions. Let's see, this question has caught my attention because it says, do colleges only offer the full merit package after a student commits? No. Um, many times they will say when your student is admitted, they'll create a financial aid package and they'll give you exactly how much your student will pay. It's not a secret. Um, they're admitted and then they're saying this will be the cost of attendance. So it's not something that you have to commit and then the school will say, surprise, this is what you have to pay. The exception to that is if you apply early decision, which is a financially binding contract that says no matter what aid you're offered, you will give that. So 
um, you will pay that. So early decision is the only the only factor there. Besides that, no, you you receive your financial aid package. All right. So there are three different kinds of merit scholarships. I've touched on this a little bit. Again, those automatic that your student applies and they're automatically applied. We, we'll have some examples and um, later slides. Um, competitive scholarships. Some students um, will apply for scholarships um, after their uh, they are admitted. Sometimes scholarships open for that school and they say, great, you're admitted. Here are some other um, competitive scholarships. Typically, that's an application essay, list of activities, something along those lines. Sometimes they're major specific. So if your student is going to study STEM, um, the arts, things of that nature. So those are more competitive applica applications that your student can apply for. And then again, there's a talent piece of it that if your student is applying to a school where perhaps they need to audition or have an arts portfolio. I know for, I am located in Arizona um, and our schools actually have um, portfolios that students can put together of their artwork and receive scholarships, even if they're not studying art. So it's really a search and find. And that's why the insights tool is really fantastic because um, some questions here, it, it helps you find out those automatic aid and um, some of the competitive scholarships. So how does merit factor into student athlete and academic versus athletic scholarships? That is a great question. So we're gonna talk about automatic um, merit aid examples here. Um, when it comes to athletic scholarships, that's really on a case by case basis. Again, that would be working with coaches. Um, it depends on what division the student is able to um, be recruited from for the coach. The coach typically will have a chunk of money to recruit um, or not. Some coaches don't have scholarships. They really depend on the student having merit aid. This is a fantastic um, piece here to show automatic merit aid. So many times if your student is a student athlete, even if they're mo the most fantastic student athlete in the world, their GPA and their test scores are still gonna be a key factor because the school can still award those merit scholarships. So um, automatic merit aid is, as you can see, this is year over year. <laughs> the differences that have um, that happen year over year, something that students, um, that families can kind of get caught in is, well, last year we were offered this scholarship um, or my or you may have multiple students and one was offered a different scholarship. So you want to be aware of the changes that are announced for merit scholarships. Some schools, like this is a great example, um, they're very clear about merit scholarships. So they will say weighted or unweighted GPA, this is exactly what we're looking for. Ohio, many in-state schools will say this is exactly what we're looking for for in-state students. We will award this amount. Not every school is as transparent, so it's really dependent, but this is a great way of looking at this is looking at weighted GPA or test score. Um, so again, there are different factors. And when your student is applying, they will automatically get this in their financial aid package. But you can also look at um, insights to see what that cost would be. But again, automatic merit aid is the best kind because it's automatically applied to your student's financial aid package. An example, we we touched on this a little bit, the competitive merit aid. Um, again, there are um, the key factor here would be applying early. So the recommendation is um, that you apply for early action as much as possible um, because, again, you'll have the largest chunk of money that is given um, to the students if they apply early action. And then they can open up portals oftentimes for competitive scholarships. So you see some examples here of merit scholarships where um, they have to apply, they are competitive, not every student is awarded them, but they are opened after they are accepted to the university. I know that's the case of many in-state schools as well. They have a scholarship portal, but they want to know that you've already um, applied for admissions. So these are just two examples. And again, the earlier, the better on these, um, because the largest, if you think of the college, they're trying to fill their class, they have a large amount of money, Sometimes it's automatic, but sometimes it's competitive and they say, okay, this student is proactive. They've gone after the first um, deadline. We know that they're serious about our school and that's when more um, scholarships can open to your students. So we highly recommend applying early action if at all possible, or if there's a rolling admissions process that you're applying um, the first couple of weeks of school or even some applications open as early as July 1st of your students rising senior year.
Um, let's see, for early action, is it too early to include senior grades? What if you want to include more grades to bring up your GPA? For early action, yes, it's only after your junior year grades are completed. Those are self-reported. Um, so something that's important to note with that is that your senior, your student senior year grades, um, I, I don't, I haven't really ever seen where a student needs to wait until their senior year grades are submitted. What can happen is um, when your student is, um, has maybe done really well their senior year, they can talk to their admissions officer and have a re um, a review of their file to see if they are more competitive for some scholarships. So I know for me personally, many schools will say, hey, your GPA boosted, we'll give you more money. So it just yeah. it's depending on the school. Some schools don't look at your senior um, and grade. Unfortunately, and I don't know the name of the yeah. school offhand, um, somebody just actually emailed us the other day. It can happen the other way. If your student um, GPA significantly changes, between the time that they applied and the um, end of the year. And most likely it's a school that has like strict bans of how they give um, merit. So like they'll have a, a ban that says, you know, for uh, 3.8 to 4.0, you get this. From 3.5 to 3.8, you get this. Um, a student could actually be downgraded too. Yes. So that's why, I mean, you know, being on top of senioritis and making sure your students, um, you know, GPA and high school GPA doesn't really tank is important. Yes. Okay. So I mentioned um, earlier about important numbers to know in the process. Um, and then I'm going to go over what those numbers are. So the three most important numbers um, are cost of attendance, SAI, student aid index, um, and your budget. Actually, I guess I should, yeah, and, and your budget. Um, so cost of attendance is the official um, full in cost of what, um, of what it's gonna, you know, of what a college's list on their website. And so that is going to include what they call direct and, and potentially indirect costs. It could include, um, it will include tuition, room and board, but then it will include an allowance for other things like travel, um, like general spending money, um, books and supplies, um, maybe health insurance. So that's actually an official number that uh, colleges have on their website. Um, so that that's the highest, hopefully any student will pay at that school. Um, um, but that, that's, that's the number that the financial aid office uses to gauge uh, a family's need. The next number to know is student aid index, and we could do a whole separate webinar on how that's calculated. But um, for now, the student aid index is what is the output of when you fill out FAFSA. Um, uh, you can actually start to estimate what your student aid index is going to be. Uh, the government has a student aid calculator now or estimator. So I, I would just Google federal um, student aid estimator, and you'll get it on the um, Department of Education site. Um, this replaced, I don't know if you guys are familiar with what was called EFC or expected family contribution, but colleges use the SAI to gauge, you know, how needy your family is. And so if you see um, the next uh, equation that I have, is the cost of attendance minus your SAI is your family's need. So that is what the college is going to look at to determine whether you have um, financial need and whether or not the college is going to give you money towards that financial need. So your, finan your family's need changes based on the college that you're looking at. Your SAI is going to be the same regardless of what college you're, you're, um, you're, your student's looking at. But the COA, right, changes college by college. So that's why you, at some schools um, you might have uh, a family need and in other schools you might not. So I just want to show you that example. So here, um, in this case on the left, a family has an SAI of 30,000, right? Um, the first school they're looking at uh, is a cost of attendance of 50,000. In that case, their family's need is 20,000. So they have a family need, um, and um, but it's gonna be different at the next school because at the next school, the cost of attendance is 80,000. So in this case, their family's need is 50,000. So you can see how your family need is going to vary school by school because it depends on what the cost of attendance of that school is. Um, and then in the next example on the right, 
in this case, I took a, 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 a an example of a family with a higher um, SAI, which probably um, is going to come from because they have a higher um, adjusted um, gross income for their family. In this case, and I purposely picked an SAI that was probably higher than most colleges' costs of attendance. Um, the family has an SAI of ninety thousand. Uh, in the first example, in most examples with an um, with an SAI of ninety thousand, a family is not going to have need at at you know probably ninety eight percent of schools. Um, and in the first example, the cost of attendance of that school is forty thousand. So you can see that they are way below. Um, the cost and a school is going to look at that family and say, you do not have financial needs. So we're not going to consider you for any need-based aid. Um, but this is why it's important to know, does that school offer merit scholarships? Because that's the only way a family with a SAI of 90,000 is going to reduce the cost of college if they get merit scholarships, because they're not going to get need-based aid. And then in the next example, just to you know, kind of show it again, this is a college with a cost of attendance of 80,000. Again, it's still below the 90,000. So there's less of what you know, we would call a family need. Um, and in this case, um, the, again, it would be important to know, does the college offer merit scholarships? So um, for the family on the right, the only way they're gonna reduce college is by finding schools with merit scholarships. The family on the left, could um, reduce college by both looking for a college that's going to um, help them with their financial need and potentially a college that also could give them merit scholarships. Okay, here's an, here is now where we factor in your budget, right? I said there were three important numbers. I should probably say four important numbers because family need is a number. But so there's the cost of attendance, your SAI, um, and now it's your budget. And I, and somebody actually just um, put this in the, uh, Facebook group the other day, and they said, they asked us, they said, Debbie, can you do um, a webinar on uh, how to determine a family's budget? And I thought, that's a great idea. We will. Again, sorry, it's a separate presentation, but um, it's it's not that difficult. But basically, you as a family need to decide how much are you willing to spend for college. And um, that that could be, well, there could be a lot of factors in that. Um, um, it depends how many students you have or how many kids you have, right? I mean, a family who has one child obviously um, might have more to put towards college versus a family that's going to have to put three students um, through college. A family that might have other expenses that a college might not know about. You Maybe you're supporting you know, an elderly parent. Maybe you have a disabled student. Um, maybe um, you have an, another sibling or another student who's going to a specialized school that, that costs extra money. So there could be a lot of reasons what, you know, that, that determine your budget. Only you as a family, right, can sit down and really figure that out. So um, that budget can be a very different number than what your student aid index is. Um, I had a mother, um, this was about two years ago, who, um, you know, they were luckily came from an, an upper middle, an upper income family. Her um, EFC at the time was over a hundred thousand, so she knew, you know, she was never going to get financial need. But she had four kids to put through college, and so she said, "I am not spending more than thirty thousand dollars per year per child, and that's my budget." All the schools, you know, were looking at her numbers, saying, "But your EFC is a hundred thousand. That's fine." But she had decided that, you know, she was only going to spend a certain amount, the thirty thousand per student per year. So she had to do the research, right, to find the schools that either had a cost of attendance that were thirty thousand below, which were probably going to be state schools, um, her own state school, and maybe some other nearby state schools, or she had to find a school where. Um, the net cost after they might have offered her student merit scholarships was going to give get her close to thirty thousand. So that's why you need. It's kind of like it's um, uh, you need to know right. Like what if you had a map, you need to know where what what your endpoint is, what you're working towards. That's that's the budget number. You know, hopefully you can ultimately find a school that gets close to the budget. Um, that's you know. I, I, that's the research and the hard part of this. Um, at some point, you know, you might have to either decide to increase your budget or, you know, this is at some point decide um, how important um, uh, you might want to consider um, 
uh, loans, but that's you know um, a little further down. So let me get this quick example. So in this case, I took the family that had the ninety thousand um, dollar SAI because they're probably going to be. They're not. We know that they're not going to get need based aid at most schools, um, and but they had decided that their budget was forty five thousand a year, right? So that's that dotted line going across. So first example, the school has a cost of attendance of forty thousand by quick, you know, default, that school is going to come in less than their budget, they might consider that, you know, um, to put on their students list if other factors, you know, fit the students. Uh, but at least they know it fits their budget. In the um, example on the far right, that school, it did have a cost of attendance of 80,000, which was over their budget, but they also offered merit scholarships. So they did the research beforehand and that family knew that if the student applied to that college and they got accepted, there was a high likelihood that that student could be offered merit scholarships. And we'll talk about how they would know that. And so in that case, if the student was offered 25,000, right, at least it gets it closer to the budget, didn't get it all the way to the budget. And then, then they'd have to decide this family, did they wanna take out um, additional loans to cover the gap? And then there are federal loans that the student could take out. But um, this is all research that can be done and should be done before your student decides to apply. And these are the discussions that you need to have, hopefully for that family who is in here with an eighth grader, you can be having these discussions um, early in high school. You should be figuring out these numbers early in high school, in ninth grade, 10th grade. You have to figure out these numbers in 11th grade, and you have to have these conversations with your students before you start down the, um, the, the visiting path and, and, um, and researching colleges. Okay, and then the last point I wanted to make was that, um, and this goes, this, this uh, grid shows you um, that um, th it's a combination of how attractive your student is from an academic standpoint and where your family falls on that neediness um, uh, range. Um, and this, like this thinking um, does usually apply to schools that we call our need aware. So um, need aware schools um, go through the admissions process and they're looking at your students, you know, academics and the application and the essay, but they are aware of how much financial need your family might need. Um, and honestly, it is the bulk of the colleges. There is a smaller group of colleges that we, they call need blind. Those are colleges that um, have very wealthy endowments. They um, are in a financial situation where they can truly say, um, we don't need to know how needy a student's family is. We are just going to look at how strong that student's academic are and all the other you know, factors that are important to us from an institutional standpoint. And that's how we're gonna decide whether to accept that student. As we, a lot of us hopefully know, and if you don't, majority of those need blind um, uh, colleges are tend to be, oh, there go my balloons. I think that's a, <laughs> that's a Mac um, uh, thing that's happening these days. It's kind of fun, but I never know when it gets triggered. Um, so need blind schools, tend to be the Ivies and some of like what they call the, you know, the Ivy plus kind of the schools right below the Ivies because they just are wealthy enough that they can take that approach. Um, I have to say that, I guess I would say, unfortunately, there are more schools these days that are going to fall into the need aware category, just with everything that's going on um, with colleges as a business these days. Again, you, you, your family, you may not be aware, but maybe you are if you're kind of on social media and in the Facebook group. This past year with FAFSA has been a fiasco. The, it's called FF, the FAFSA fiasco. And um, it, it, it's going to have so many ramifications for students, for enrollment, and ultimately it's going to affect a lot of colleges' financial situation. So um, uh, I think looking into a college's financial health is going to become even more important next year. And we can actually have a, another discussion, a webinar about that. But um, so now schools, the reason um, there need to be more need aware is because they're gonna need to be even smarter and more effective and efficient about how they spend their, their scholarship money. And that's really what this is. Merit scholarships, even financial aid, it's, it's this, 
institution's money, and that's why it's called you know institutional grants. It's the it's the institution's money, and it's their decision about how they're going to give it to students to both help students and both attract students to the to the institution. So let me quickly go through this um, grid. So what we're saying here is that students that are at the top of a college's academic range, right, um, and uh, a family that might not need need-based aid is going to be very attractive to a school because a school can offer them merit scholarships, get a really strong student at that school. And to some extent, it's, I guess, a win-win for both. It's a win for the student because you know they're getting money to reduce their costs. It's a win for the college because they may be getting a student who's stronger than um, than than their average. So uh, you know the ultimate goal is that they're all trying to increase their competitiveness, and one way to increase the competitiveness is to increase the caliber of the students that come, which ultimately increases their you know academic strength. So um, again, I get this question a lot. We see this um, where. A family might say, um, I thought that student, I thought that school gave out merit scholarships, but my student either didn't get that much merit scholarships or didn't get any merit scholarships. And the reason is it was probably a student that um, was just not as academically attractive to the college. So um, your student could apply to a college that gives out merit scholarships, but if your student's not at the top of the academic range, then the school's not going to say, I want to spend my money, right, to attract that student because I'd rather attract the really stronger student. And so usually this, the, the example that I gave with where the family said they didn't get merit scholarship money or they didn't get the amount that they thought is because the student was not um, as strong of a, a, a candidate um, relative to that school's, um, you know, profile. So that was probably a student that was below the average um, you know, might still have been in the range, but, um, and the school, and actually, to some extent, the fact that that family might have been, had a strong financial situation might have been the reason why the student got accepted a little bit less about their academics and more because the family might be a full pay family. So, um, so just understand that those two factors do play a role. Okay, and then my last quick um, story here is again, and you don't have to read this, uh, but of a family where um, the mother like shared her story that the student um, had applied to six schools, uh, but the student's college list was not balanced. And what we mean by balance is it didn't have um, a you know a good enough um, a number of schools schools that might be reaches that might be you know. Um, uh, matches that might be safeties and it's it's really hard to even define what those words mean anymore these days but um you want you do want to have a, a range where um it looks pretty confidently that your student is very strong for a school so we would call that you know a good match or a safety um and in this example first of all this you know if you're a family that what we call chasing merit um, you probably are, your student's probably going to have a college list that's on the larger side because I'm giving you all this advice. You know, I've seen a lot of things, but at the end of the day, nobody can guarantee anything, right? I can't guarantee that you're going to get a certain amount from a school. Um, wish I could. Um, so, you know, to compensate, you know, for having no guarantees in this process, you're probably going to have to cast a larger net, right? And that means that your student's going to have um, replying to probably more schools uh, uh, than, than, than fewer schools because you want to kind of, um, you know, just see what the possibilities are. You also maybe want to have a few offers so that next year at this time you could go back in and nobody likes this word, but we're going to say it, negotiate with the colleges and kind of show that my student got into a few of these other schools and um, let me show you the offers and, and you know, can you match them or, or do better? So in this example, the student only applied to six schools. Of those six schools, four of them were reachers, which quite honestly, we're just going to call them crapshoots, right? Because we, you know, when when you get to the reach stage, um, um, and that's actually another discussion, and we actually have a former admissions officer who who's going to give a talk about how the admissions process really works. You know, like when sitting on their side of of, uh, of the fence, and um, um, you know. Um, you you end up having 
great students. They're so, so similar. So which one the college picks, you know, might end up being um, based on their institutional priorities. Anyhow, it's such a crapshoot in, in, in this, you know, reach and Ivy situations that um, this student um, had too many of those on their list. Um, and they ended up only getting into two schools. One was the school they really wanted to, but ended up not being um, financially possible for this student, for the family. And the other was a school that financially fit, but wasn't a, a place that they wanted to go. So, you know, the whole point of this story is you want to be in the position a year from now, hopefully actually, um, we won't be in May uh, talking about it because there won't be a fa FAFSA fiasco. So you'll have all this information in April. Um, so you want a year in, in next April, you want to be in the situation where your student has good options to choose from. Um, and that's all going to come down to how you build that college list and where your student applies. So let's we're going to get into um, building our tips for building a balanced list. Let's do this quickly, Monica, and then we'll I'll show insights. Absolutely. I was busy answering some questions in the chat. So thank you, Debbie. This was fantastic. <laughs> All right. So tips for building a college list. We already, um, college search is key. Um, our insights tool is really what we are striving to get towards because this is a key factor. I've seen many questions in the chat talking about, you know, where do we find lists like this? And that's really our insights tool. So we're excited to share that. So the college search tips we look at, again, know your student aid index, talk to your student about what you will be contributing financially. Talk to your student about what the weight is of taking out loans and private scholarships. So that's a key factor. We highly recommend having those conversations, you know, maybe not with your eighth grade student <laughs> saying you're on your own kid after 18. <laughs> I have seen parents do that and it's a little stressful. Um, so maybe not that approach, um, but it's really important for your student to know, okay, this is, this is what we have saved. And this is, you know, the expectation for you. That way they don't have these high lofty goals where they won't be able to meet that without taking out pretty devastating loans. So again, are you looking for need-based or merit scholarships? Um, what academic rigor will your student take? What classes will they take um, to, you know, strive for this college search? Cast a wide net. That's really important. Um, don't just apply for schools that, um, you are that are those reach schools, but cast wide net. Always include a state school. We have learned what the number one thing I learned with COVID, honestly, was we had students paying out of state tuition when they were living with their parents in state. So you always want to make sure there's at least one in state option um, because in state really will have more than likely the highest merit scholarships. So um, that's something to keep in mind. And honestly, it's a it's a great way to see um, how cost of attendance can be. Um, pretty low if you stay in state and you um, look at those schools. So include um, financial safety schools as well as um, schools that maybe your student wouldn't necessarily apply to, but you can have conversations. And what I've recommended several times in the chat, reaching out to your college admissions officer, they're normally regionally based or the financial aid office and telling them, hey, this school offered me this amount. This is a school I want to go to. Your school is a school I want to go to. Are there any scholarships I can apply for? Any maneuvering? Some schools are very, very good about saying, hey, the scholarship deadline's coming up. Hey, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? Um, if your student is accepted into that school, again, you can't get money that you don't apply for. So make sure you're applying to schools, even that maybe they're not 100% sold on that, but you can also use that as financial leverage and saying, what are some other scholarships um, that can help me attend this school? Um, there's one school in particular that I know if a student is determined to go there, they will say, okay, they'll be emailing them every day, apply to the school, apply to this scholarship. I mean, apply to this scholarship. So it's important to be in touch with your regional admissions officer. The next slide is, um, call it, um, the, our insights tool, um, is really fantastic. Debbie will go over that. Um, and we pull from all of these different resources, all of the different government data, and we've created this incredible tool um, for you to look for these merit scholarships. So we're excited to share with that. Yeah. So let me just tell you quickly, um, and again, maybe some of you are familiar. If not, um, we'll do a different webinar on this, but you can start researching. There's something called the Common Data Set. It is so valuable. Um, it is where colleges share a lot of kind of like you know, all their, uh, as much inside information as we're going to be able to get on a college. Um, so 
Um, there's a lot of data on it. Um, some of it is useful. Some of it is just interesting. Um, but um, as of now, most colleges just kind of share it on their website. There's not really one source um, where you can kind of pull all of the common data set information together. But but that is what one of the purposes of what we did with our insights tool. So um, it makes it much easier to search all of the college's common data information and um, rather than having to go to each college individually uh, and find their common data set. We also pulled data from the government. There's the government's website about colleges is called iPads. It's a free website. Again, people can go and use it. It's just not that user friendly. And then the last um, data source that we use, which probably is the most interesting and valuable, is um, actual crowdsourced offers that we have been collecting from families probably for the past five years. So we actually, we have families share what their students actually got the common data set is colleges telling you what they're going to do but the but the crowdsource information is what they colleges actually did so um you can look at a student's uh gpa what state they're from because that sometimes impacts um aid um you know and how much they got in merit and whether or not they actually um submitted their test scores uh so um you know because that's even though some schools now are going back to test required, obviously the past few years, test optional has been a big thing and there's still gonna be a chunk of schools that, that remain test optional. Okay, let me switch over and I will quickly show you how to use Insights um, and then we'll answer any questions. Okay, so let me add the stop share and let me pull up another website, oops. Okay, let me share again. Okay, Monica, can you see? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so I just typed in, and maybe Monica, you can type it into um, the chat. Uh, this, it, the insight, the, sorry, the URL is insights.roadtocollege.com. And um, it, if you uh, go to that page, this is what you'll get. Um, if you don't have an account already and, and actually creating uh, an account is free, it, you have limited use, but you get a sense, you can see what's in there. Um, actually, sorry, oops, I have an account. So I'm just going to skip to sign in. Um, and if you don't have an account and you're signing in for the first time, there's just a few other extra um, screens that show up just because we we need some profile information about your student or what year in high school they, they're in. Um, and then we actually, there's other profile information. If you want to, it's not required. You can share. I'll just show you quickly. Um, and this profile information like location, your budget, your SAI, your household income, um, whether or not your student took the SAT and what it is, it just helps us because we have some automatic recommendations. So, you know, the more information you tell us, we can you know, share our recommendations. If you don't want to, that's fine too, but just kind of showing you why we ask for um, the profile information. So there's um, a few different ways you can search. I'm going to jump to um, what we call power search to quickly show you um, how you can find colleges. Um, so we built this really focusing on the financial aspect of searching for colleges. So you can search by cost of attendance. You can search by average merit award amount. You can search by the net cost, which would be what the cost of attendance is minus any merit if you know the college offers merit. You can search by percent of need met. This is an important number for those families that um, have financial need and need to find a college that's going to offer them money to cover the financial need. So, um, so you can search by that. You can then we have some kind of softer um, uh, criteria. You can search by school size because maybe um, you know a, a, a smaller school is more important to your student. Um, you again, search by um, deadlines. And here, the other important thing is if you want to find that school where your student is most likely to get merit, you want to find the schools where their 
test scores are going to put them at the top of the range. So um, you, if you picked, you know, at SAT, you know, um, and I'm going to put in, let's say 1200 to 1300, then you would click um, if you, again, you wanted to find this, the schools where your student is at the top of the range, you're going to click the option that says top range. Um, and, um, you know, you could click average. That would just, you know, give your student a good chance of getting in, but it might not give your student a good chance of getting merit. Um, so, and then this is just one search, right? And, um, and this is what I mean by casting a wide net. This, all I did here is I, I'm searching by test score. And um, I could add on the other factors, but I'm not going to yet. And, and I just put in a range of 1200 to 1300. And I said, show me the schools where that range is in the top um, 75th percentile of colleges. Okay, and it actually automatically spits back the colleges, there's 293 of them. And then I can sort them all the different ways. Um, I can sort them by location, school size. I can sort them by cost. I can sort them by um, um, average test score, the 75th percentile test score. I can sort them by um, early decision admit rate, if they have early decision. Um, but in this case, let's just sort, sort by average merit aid, okay? So now I have a list. Um, if my student is in that 1200 to 1300 SAT range, um, I know is a really good likelihood that they'll probably, you know, that there's, there's a good chance that they'll be accepted because it's up there at the higher end. And if they get accepted, there's a good chance that they're going to get merit scholarship money. Um, so here, and I sorted this by, you know, highest to lowest merit scholarship. Um, here's Susquehanna, which actually we know um, does give out generous aid. Uh, is has is giving out the highest of thirty six thousand. That's the average. So um, there are some students that are going to get above, and some students that are going to get below the average. And again, that's going to be based on where they fall in that in that range. Are they at the tippy top of um, the school's academic range, or you know, are they in the middle? So um, you know, honestly, I if I'm at, uh, searching and I'm chasing merit, I would start going through these colleges, and then um, to me, there's you know, different levels or layers of searching. I've done the first financial cut, right? Now I've, I've kind of, I'm finding schools where my student can get merit. Um, now I got to see, do they fit some other criteria? Do they, um, you know, maybe they don't want to go to some of these locations, you know, maybe they want a bigger or a larger school. That's going to start to narrow down the list and you're going to see um, whether or not once you layer on the other factors, can you still find schools that are affordable? You may or you may not be able to. So you might have to loosen up some of the other criteria. Oh, my student only wanted to go to a top 10, you know, like um, um, public school, you know, where they have big football uh, games. Okay, but I can't find a school that's affordable. So I might not be able to meet that criteria. I'm going to have to kind of scale back um, and maybe we're going to have to look at um, a smaller school, because you will find, and this is just the general kind of finding, is that smaller, well, first of all, um, over, and I don't know what the percentage is, but I know it's over 50%, over 50% of colleges are actually small colleges. They are probably uh, less than 5,000 um, in total um, um, student population. Um, and so, and they also tend to be more generous. So um, just keep that in mind. Those you know, top 10 public schools, University of Wisconsin, um, you know, University of Michigan as an out-of-state student, um, Ohio State, they're, they could be great schools. They, I mean, they are good schools. They're great academic schools. They're just not generous. So, um, you know, you have to um, know that, and that's the stuff you can find out before your student applies. So let me just click into um, Susquehanna. And so, so this is just, this is profile information. Some of this you can get elsewhere, you know, um, um, about, you know, are they a public or private school? What, what's the number of undergraduates they have? Um, we break out the admission stats, which aren't always breaking, broken out all over the place. First of all, you can see a distribution of GPA. Um, here's their SAT stats. Um, in this case, um, um, Susquehanna, um, I think, just has like a rolling admission, um, so they don't have early decision and 
early action, but I'll show you a school that does. But what I wanted to show you about Susquehanna is if you if you look at the crowdsourced offers, these are the offers of actual families sharing with us. Um, we have this year of 2024, 2025, these are students who just got their offers over the past month or even you know this month. And you can start to scroll through. These are um, ordered by, um, by SAI or EFC range. So if you're a family who isn't have financial need, you're probably in the range, and you can see we have a lot for Susquehanna, you're probably in the range of um, a SAI of above 60,000, right? So now you can see, I think the average was 36,000 merit that Susquehanna like reports, but you can see that students are getting above 36,000. Um, these are probably students with a uh, SAT on the higher end. It could have just been, um, I mean, this student has a, a, a 4.0 GPA. So there's a, sl there's a slight range in what these students are getting, somewhere between 43,000 to 48,000. Um, so this is where you can kind of go in and see you know, the exact details of what other students got. Um, is it scientific? Can this predict what your student can get? No, but it gives you the sense of, of the types of offers that um, students are really getting. Okay, um, so let me go back to the power search. Um, so I could layer onto this, um, or let's do, let's clear, do it. Let me clear the search. I can say, um, show me, private colleges that have a cost of attendance. Let's say I had this budget that I wanted to meet that has a cost of attendance between zero, nobody has zero, but and zero and 40,000, because maybe I have this you know, budget of $35,000. Um, and then I can sort this by private cost of attendance. Um, you know, this is a tough number to meet. So these are the schools that have cost of attendance um, of without any sort of aid, without merit, without with a financial need. Um, this is kind of what we would call their sticker price, their retail price. Um, these are the schools that have those costs of attendance. Um, you know, it's just the reality, whether we like it or not, the colleges are playing the pricing game of, um, I'm gonna price high, I'm gonna discount, and then your net, your net cost is, is, you know, after the discount, um, you know, uh, whether we agree or not, you know, that, I, you know, it doesn't matter. That's the game that they're playing. So that's kind of what you need to know when you're doing your research. So, um, but, so let me go to um, a, an out-of-state school and see if there's any out-of-state schools that are in that price range. And I'm going to sort by out-of-state. Um, so, you know, there might be, there's, you know, West Virginia at a little under 40,000, University of uh, Louisville. Um, Florida State. Um, so there are some schools out of, you know, if you, if you want to look out of state that might um, offer that uh, cost of attendance within your budget, but that's one way of, um, of using the tool. Um, you can also look at, let me just see, I'm not, I'm not even going to put any sort of academics um, criteria. Let me just see which schools um, offer high merit awards. Let's see, an, an average merit of between 30 and 50,000. Okay, now I'm gonna sort this by merit, average merit. And so, okay, here's a good example. So Swarthmore came up and they have average merit of 45,000. Wow, that sounds great. And they're an amazing school, right? But look at the one other piece of data you need to look at um, right above it. The one that says percent of freshmen without need receiving merit, right? So that's how many students who don't have any sort of financial need, who, who enrolled in Swarthmore are actually getting merit scholarship money, 1%. So although the average merit amount was a great amount, very few students are getting it. So you obviously need to know both that information. You need to know what the average merit award is, but also how many students are actually getting that amount. Um, Washington and Lee, a little better, but still not tremendous. So 11% of students who don't have need are getting, are getting merit, but it, it starts to go up. University of Richmond, 31% of students without merit are getting the, the award. So um, these are just important numbers. Sometimes you have to look at a combination of the numbers to um, see what's going on. Let me show you one other thing. So from this search, 
you can um, pick individual schools and create a list and add them to it. If you wanted to, you can, you can add this whole list of 48 schools to um, an existing college list you have or create a whole new list um, with a new name. And then you would go to my lists and you could see even more um, data about the schools and you can sort them um, even more. So I, I have a lot of lists in here. Let me just pull up a good list. Um, oh, okay, colleges with early decision and early action deadlines. So once you go to my lists and you, you know, add some schools to a list, this is gonna populate, you get a more, um, you, get, you get all of our data that, we, that we're offering. So I'm just gonna click, I want all the sections of data about admissions, about merit and um, financial. Okay, so you can see this now. This there's a lot here for each school, and um, let me just point out some good columns that I like to look at. Um, so this was a list of schools that have early decision and early action. Um, and why I wanted to point it out is we've got these columns that break out. Um, you can see it all of the admission information. So you've got overall admit rate early decision admit rate, early action rate, and then regular decision. And the reason why this is important, um, uh, as you can see, let's just, I'm just gonna use the one that's at the top of the um, list here. So Santa Clara University, their overall admit rate is 52%. Their early decision is 83%. So there's either, there's, we know there's fewer students who apply early decision and sometimes colleges take a large number of students from the early decision. So um, that's why it, in this case, it looks like, and it, it, it is, it, in theory, it was easier to get an early decision than it will be regular decision. So early decisions, 83%. Um, they have early action of 81%. So you know that's also a good uh, deadline to use. And then they'll look at their regular decision rate. So regular decision is 31%. That's because the school took students early decision, right? So when they took students early decision and those students um, by, by definition of applying early decision, if they were accepted, they're committed to going, they've, they've already taken up slots in the class, right? So there's now only there's fewer slots remaining in regular decision, it becomes harder. That's why the, the regular decision rate is lower. So it's very important to break out these numbers. Just looking at the overall admit rate, it's a blended rate and it can be skewed depending on what the underlying rates are for any early decision um, and the early action and what percent of the class the college takes early decision. And, and we actually have that field here. Let me actually, let me, uh, um, um, and I'm going to explain some of these numbers that are over 100%, but let's look at Tulane. Tulane is notorious for doing this. Um, again, we can't control it. All we can do is alert people to this is what happens. Um, so Tulane, their overall admit rate is 11%. Early decision rate is 68%, right? Regular decision is 8%. The reason why um, that overall admit rate is 11% is because they take 68% of the class early decision. If you want to go to Tulane, then you need to know this information ahead of time, and you need to decide how important it is, whether or not your student wants to apply early decision, because, and not to be a, you know, Debbie Downer, but um, if your student wants to go to Tulane and they don't apply early decision, it's going to be even tougher to get in regular decision. Um, so, um, just be realistic and know this information ahead of time. Um, so that's that's important information that I like to look at. The other um, thing I will just point out here is we have all of the fields about um, uh, here. Sorry, what percent? What percent of the class does not have need? Right, which is important. That means what percent of students going to that school. Um, either are paying full price or they're getting some sort of merit scholarships. Uh, so at the more expensive schools, you tend to find a higher percentage of families, obviously who can't afford it. And so they tend to be um, families without needs. You can see Colorado College, 60% of the students who are going there do not have financial need. Um, 
20% of those students, 20% of the 60% are getting some sort of merit aid. Not that much though. They're getting, you know, 8,500 and the cost to attend is 87,000. Still an expensive school, even though some students are getting merit. Um, so again, you can, you can sort these fields. Um, again, University of Richmond came up higher. Oh, this is a list of early decision, early action schools of giving um, generous aid. 61% of their students do not have need and 31% of the students without need are getting some sort of merit on average $42,000 of merit. So this is how you can start to predict, right? If, if the um, cost of attendance um, at University of Richmond is 81,000 and quite honestly, it's gonna be even higher because these are these, these numbers that don't reflect the, um, the new cost of attendance numbers that are going to come out in the in the summer but let's just so so basically it's you know uh, like around thirty nine thousand dollars if your student gets this um highest merit award or the average i should say that could be higher um to go to university of richmond we your student didn't have to apply right we know that now we can you know do i know the exact number it's going to cost you no do i know the exact average merit it's gonna your student's gonna get no but if your student um you know is at the high range of university of richmond's academic profile and they get in there's a very high likelihood that they will be offered you know this average merit and now you can predict that at least the net cost of going to university of richmond should be between you know thirty nine thousand and maybe forty five thousand um, so, and we know that, and your student hasn't even written an essay and they haven't even, you know, filled out an application. Okay. It is after one o'clock. I'm going to stop sharing and let me look at some questions. And thank you everybody who's here. If you need to go completely understand, um, it's during the middle of the day. I will, um, you know, try and answer as many questions as possible. Um, but um, I just wanted to thank people who have to leave for being here today. Um, oh, great question. Can you tell the age of the data, ultimately when the various components get updated and when do the crowdsource data typically get in and how many people actually do it? Perfect question. Thank you. I will answer that. So um, let's start the easy one with which is crowdsource data. The soon as somebody enters it in, we actually have a different site. Um, to collect crowdsourced data. As soon as somebody enters in an offer, it is automatically available um, in Insights. So that is instantaneous. Um, you know, that's why we have all those offers from the current um, high school class of seniors. Um, the other data. Uh, so, the, so I mentioned when I talked about the sources of data, uh, one is the common data set, one is from iPads, the, the um, government. The reason why, well, first of all, the government does not have all the data that is collected in the common data set. Um, but the reason why a lot of people use the common data set, we use it, I mean, a, lo a lot of um, good search sites is because it is the most recent data that's available out there. But what does most recent mean? Um, first of all, the government data tends to be 18 months, maybe 24 months delayed. It just is. That's the government process. That's, that's the way, you know, um, it, it takes them to, to update their site, the common data set tends to be a year behind. It's it, you know so what that means is so for uh, the data that's in here right now, it's for the class. I always have to think of this for a second. It is for the class of students that are, are that entered college in fall of 2022, right? So the students who entered in fall of 2022, that's the admission information that's really related, related to it. And the reason why is common data set information is collected after the class enrolls. So the class has to start in the fall. So this past year, right, the, the students started, they were enrolled the fall of 2023. Um, so it's only in, from like from like, like November to um, actually April that colleges collect all of their data and start to fill out the common data set. So they, they, they can only fill out the common data set after students have enrolled. So, um, so, so this, so common data set information about the students who just enrolled in 2023 isn't available yet. It becomes available this summer. So tens, usually July, beginning of August, um, that's when our data gets updated. That's when 
um, a lot of colleges start sharing their common data sets. So um, it's just, uh, I mean, that's just the fact that the, the I mean, I guess you can say the col the data is a year old. Um, the way I look at it is um, uh, most from year to year, uh, colleges like in relativeness to each other don't change that much. So a college that, you know, had, was maybe more selective than another college that, that ranking, that ordering is going to stay the same. Does their merit scholarship average change? Yeah, but probably, you know, by a thousand or two, it's not going to, you're not going to see these huge jumps. Um, the only place maybe you'll see changes is unfortunately, you know, um, cost of attendance. Um, let me just tell you that the actual costs of that that students have to pay for the students who are graduating high school, they still don't know that final tuition cost yet because tuition prices don't get set by colleges until usually June of the of after um, students are accepted to college. It's a bad cycle. It's just bad. I wish I could change it, but that's just the reality. Um, so in theory, you know, when I mean, um, when we get the data over the summer, it is the most up-to-date data, though it is technically, you know, like um, uh, 12 months behind the students who um, are enrolling in, in college that fall. Okay, um, let's see a few other questions. I've been trying to answer as quickly as possible in the chat. There are some great discussions going on and um, a lot of questions about the insights tool that they're excited about. So I'll post the link again. Okay. So how many colleges do you have in the insights tool? Another good question. We have mainly all four year colleges, um, public and private that accept um, federal funding um, because um, that's kind of the, the, the colleges that share their common data set. I think it's really like 39,000. Colleges, so there should be enough for you to choose from. Um, we don't have community colleges in there. That might be something in the future. So it's really four-year U.S.-based colleges. Um, how do you decide early decision if you don't know if you can afford it? I see that, um, uh, Monica, you answered that. But um, two things. For early decision colleges, those tend to be, um, you know, more well-endowed schools. Um, they also, uh, one thing I did mention is that all schools have what's called a net price calculator uh, on their websites. Uh, we have a link for it within um, Insights. Oh, I'm not sharing, but it, it is uh, one of the columns. Um, or you can Google any college and say, you know, University of Richmond net price calculator, and it will get, get you to the next, next net price calculator on their website. Um, uh, the, the estimate of the net price calculator is not guaranteed, but what um, we have seen is that for more selective schools that offer early decision, and um, a lot of schools that do offer early decision, their net price calculator tends to be much, much, much more accurate than the average. So always do the net price calculator, keep a copy of what the next price net price cal calculator um, tells you keep a copy of your inputs of what of what you told the net price calculator and then keep a copy of the output. Um, that's the best way for an early decision school to know if you'll be able to afford it plus looking at the numbers within insights or the common data set. Um, there is the one like small caveat about early decision if for whatever reason the financial aid offer that the school does send you after your student accepted is either wildly different than the net price calculator or you truly cannot afford um, the school, then you can get out of, um, of early decision, but you have to show that, you know, it's it's not um, financially feasible. Um, and, uh, you know, so the, the, the college doesn't want to hold you to a commitment that you can't financially um, follow through on, but they are hoping that um, you are being responsible and doing your research before your student applies early decision. Okay, is there any disadvantage to applying early action? Absolutely not. We encourage if the school has an early action option, um, apply. In fact, actually 
I'm not saying it's because the advice we give, but I think in general, a lot of people in admissions will give this advice. And we are seeing more and more, and particularly this past year, that more students are applying early because they've gotten the message that it's important to apply early. So um, it's, it helps in a lot of ways. You just have you'll get decisions back from colleges early, early and especially early action. And, they, you know, you'll just, you'll either know if your student has been in, um, deferred or rejected. I actually, um, uh, you know, support the colleges or I, I hope that their colleges will make a good decision like that. It's, it's, it's hard to get that deferral because it just means like, oh, you're just gonna kind of have to wait. But any, but hopefully they will, you know, be more decisive in their early rounds. And um, um, there tends to be, it can go a little bit either way, but um, schools like to give out more money um, early to get students to commit. So there is a possibility that your student could get a little bit more money if they apply early action. Uh, is there a situation where a school that states no academic merit scholarships on their, on their website um, might still award academic merit scholarships anyway. Um, and the person is linking to Stanford. Uh, no, I mean, honestly, especially a school like Stanford, if they don't give merit scholarships, they don't give merit scholarships. And it's not, it's not, uh, don't go in thinking, oh, maybe there'll be something be special for my student. Um, the, the, particularly the, that level of elite colleges, they are not offering, um, merit scholarships. So, um, I wouldn't want to, you know, create false expectations that there might be a chance um, there there isn't. There might be um, a, a scholarship once your student is accepted, uh, and I'm talking about maybe as a sophomore, you know, junior or senior. There might be departmental scholarships, and there might be scholarships that the professors can point students to, but there aren't the traditional merit scholarships that a college is going to offer as part of the admissions process. I've heard of schools protecting their yield by not admitting students with very high academic achievement for that school. How big of an issue is this? That's a good question. Um, I think it's an issue for some small group of schools. It's those schools that um, I would say like are maybe a tier down from the Ivies like um, Carnegie Mellon, um, maybe Case Western where um, uh, they don't want to appear that they are accepting students um, that and and they might and they might be strong academic students and then they they know that those students might be applying to you know those schools like an example like a Carnegie Mellon as like a second choice uh, because they're really trying to get into an Ivy. So yes, there are schools that are protecting their yield. It tends to be that that kind of level of school that is just below. Um, you know, the Ivy, um, and they're, you know, trying to compete with the more selective schools. Okay, so Sonia just said, um, if you're having problems with insights, please email us at support at roachcolleges.com. I don't know, Sonia, if, if you're on a free account or if on a paid account. Um, so just give us as much information as you can, and we'll try and see what's going on. Um, okay, I'm just trying to think um, if there's anything else, I will look through the rest of these questions here um, to see if there's anything that's, um, that, I mean, that, that I can answer and probably send it is in a follow-up email, but hopefully um, this was helpful. Um, hopefully it just also gives you more information about merit scholarships in general. Um, I really encourage families, and this is just an example of um, a particular parent who we just worked with this past uh, um, uh, season. He um, uh, knew he he was he you know, had high income. He had other expenses that he needed to take care of. I think he had both a elderly parent he was supporting, and he has another child that's disabled. So even though on paper, it might've looked like he could afford to send his student to any college, um, he wanted to you know, um, limit what, what it was gonna cost him. And so he was probably one of the most diligent parents I have seen. 
He was on every webinar we gave, other people gave. He used our insights tool. He actually signed up for another program we have called Premium, where we do uh, monthly sessions on every topic. He um, paid for extra one-on-one -on -one services to really um, know that he was kind of doing as much research as possible. And uh, I mean, he, they, he and his daughter did A plus research. It was a combination of um, the father put in the time to do the research. The student was a great student. So they had like good raw material to work for, work with. She had great grades. She had good activities and they applied at a range of colleges. They applied to University of Richmond. Uh, they applied to Emory. They applied to, to um, um, Ivy League schools. He knew that he was not going to get uh, that his daughter was not going to get any need-based aid from an IV, but she just wanted to feel like she could get in because she did. She was that caliber of student. But the bottom line is he needed to find a certain, a school, you know, that was as academically strong as possible that could um, fit their budget. And um, so I just tell you this because it, it's not like it's an easy thing that, you know, um, that like might be happens in a half an hour. He spent probably three or four months of solid research. And when I say research, he did, he used things like insights. He, um, they went to, you know, information sessions. They talked to the admissions people to find out whether any other um, um, uh, scholarships that the student could apply for. Um, obviously then her, then the student had to write essays. They had to write supplemental essays, <laughs> they had to write scholarship essays. So they both worked hard. Let me just say, at the in the end, she got into two IVs. She got into a lot of schools, like the University of Richmond level, that gave her oh, there go my balloons again. That gave her merit, and she got into Emory with a full ride scholarship, um, and that is where she's choosing to go. Um, but again, that all came with a lot of work, and even Emory, they didn't find out at the very end because I mean, she applied, she got in, then she was. Um, um, asked to apply because that's how some of the merit scholarships work is that the, the college doesn't um, tell you about merit scholarships until they accept you and then they say please apply to these other schools other scholarships at the school she applied for those other scholarships she had to write additional essays she had to um, um, have interviews and it was really only three weeks ago that she found out that she got that full tuition ride so I'm saying all this to say buckle up it is a long ride it is work but it can be done um, and you can have the results that you want, both financially and academically, um, but um, you're gonna have to, you know, um, roll up your sleeves and, and um, you know, and be willing to do the work. Okay, thank you guys. I hope you have a happy rest of the Friday afternoon. Um, we'll send the recording tomorrow. I will look through the questions. You can send me questions at support at roadtocollege.com. And I hope this was helpful for you. Sorry for going over. I, um, we will keep trying and trying, trying to, to finish this in an hour. It's just so hard. Thanks. Bye.